Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm trying to get it to rotate, but it doesn't want to do that. Alright, well, it looks like we are going to have to go vertical for this video. If you are watching the replay, then you may just want to fast forward a few seconds. Let me get my coffee. Give me one second. shower. I apologize. My son is also sick. My husband was uh, going to take him out of the house for me, but he's been running a fever and puking and has a runny nose and all that jazz. So hopefully he is able to keep him on the other side of the house for us. Um, for those of you watching, if you can't hear me, let me know in the comments. Now, if you, uh, you probably read that today's video is all about seed starting. And I'm a little crooked. I'm going to fix that in a second. But seed starting. So, um, I asked for questions about seed starting beforehand. And I'm also going to answer um, any seed starting questions that come in and I also have some notes here uh, to go over just some uh, some of the things that I do when I'm starting seeds indoors. Let me go ahead and fix this. Sorry about that, guys. So, while I am giving it a second to see if anyone else joins in, uh, since we are vertical, you can't see, but I have a lot of my seed starting materials here. Um, I have a lot of my seeds here. I have some notes some things that I write down uh, whenever I'm planning out uh, what I'm going to seed start and when. Um, and then these are my planners that I use for keeping notes on everything that I seed start. Um, I like to keep notes of when I seed start things that way maybe next year. Uh, say it got leggy or very unhappy before I was able to transplant it, then I may not start it as early the following year, things like that. And then, like, here is some cocoa coir. I'm going to talk about a couple different ways. Uh, either uh, I make my own seed starting mix and... I have some of the things that I use to make my own seed starting mix or like that jiffy. Sometimes I will just use just that if I'm in a hurry and don't have time to make my own. Or if I can't find a certain ingredient like uh, perlite. Actually, I didn't even grab the perlite. But I'm sure most of you know what that is. It's the little white... Um, almost looks like little pebbles. I've got some other things um, that I sometimes use if absolutely necessary, like neem oil if I get fungus gnats. Lots of things here. 
I don't want to spend too much time uh, talking about what I have. I just want to go ahead and jump on into it. <coughs> so, uh, for starters, let me get in the middle here. So, for starters, Anything that I talk about in today's video, I will link in the description. Uh, it may take me a couple days to get all of the links together and get them in the description. So if you are watching live, then give me a little bit of time for that. Um, but if you're watching the replay, hopefully it'll be in there. If not, then leave me a comment. But I will leave all the links. Uh, they will, most of them will be Amazon links. And I will get a small commission if you choose to purchase through that link. So if you do do that, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you in advance for that. And just a little disclaimer, I'm not saying what I do in this video is the only way. Um, I feel like a lot of people get caught up because they hear so many different things from so many different people. And, you know, especially someone like me, I'm very frugal. So... If, you know, I see that there are 10 different seed starting products out there that people say to use, and I've never started seeds before, I don't want to buy, say, product A for, you know, $20 and it not work or my seedlings not grow, and then I've just wasted $20. Um, so I just want to say this is not the only way. Most seeds, if you put them in any kind of soil, or soilless seed starting mixture and give them some water and some light, they're gonna grow. But this is what I do for the, you know, happiest seedlings. For, uh, these are some tips that I've learned throughout the years from starting seeds for probably over 15 years now. So if you've never started seeds before, if you're hesitant because of all of the different information out there, just try it <laughs> so I don't have any questions that have come in yet so I'm just gonna start off with some of my tips so for starters some of the supplies that I use well the, the most important supply that I feel like is absolutely necessary especially if you're a beginner is to use a sterile seed starting mix whether it be cocoa coir or peat moss or a seed starting mix you buy you know as long as it's labeled seed starting mix most likely it's going to be sterile and it's not going to have any compost or anything like that in there excuse me and i feel like that's very important because if it has compost or any you know anything other than a sterile seed starting mix it is very likely to have insect eggs in it. So fungus gnats, uh, if you have an outbreak in your seedling grow room and you're like, where did all these fungus gnats come from? That is, you know, probably uh, the cause of it is, you know, they were in your seed starting mix. They can be in a sterile seed starting mix, but it's, it's far more unlikely. Um, so one of, and about the peat moss, um, I used to use peat moss a lot, um, but, uh, given that it's not a very, uh, what's the word? I'm having a moment. It's not a very, um, you know, you know what I'm trying to say, uh, renewable resource. So one thing that I like to use is uh, this uh, Jiffy's Natural Organic Seed Sorting Mix. This does have peat in it. Um, so when I have the time, I do like to buy these Coco Coir bricks and I try to use as little peat as possible. But if you're starting out and you're not comfortable making your own mixture, then this is a great product. It does not have really large pieces in it. Um, some seed starting mixes that I've bought, 
that are quite expensive, to be honest, have really large pieces of either peat moss or other things, and it's very time consuming to take all those out. Uh, whenever you're trying to fill up, say, a 72 cell tray, and you know, you've got all these large pieces making it difficult for things to go in, then it can be very annoying. So I really like this product because it doesn't have really large pieces. It has a little bit of perlite, but I usually add more in there. And it's one of the cheapest ones in my area here in Indiana. <laughs> now this is vermiculite. I will talk about that in a second. But the same brand, Stay Green, also makes, uh, also uh, has a bag. Also, <laughs> also sells perlite in a very similar bag. And that is what I use when I'm making my own seed starting mix. Um, I don't really measure uh, per se. What I usually do is I just look for it to look like it has, you know, say a few pieces per, you know, say if, if it's a 72 cell tray, you know, you don't want it to be like 50% perlite, 50% cocoa coir. Um, you want it to be like maybe 20%. Um, that is one thing that, you know, I feel like it's, it's different for everyone. Uh, some people, they will add 50-50 of each thing. Some people will add other things like compost and they'll add a third of each. Um, but I prefer just about, I would say about 20%. And if you've never seen a cocoa coir brick, they are much less expensive if you buy them like this. And I usually use a much larger container and I will put a couple of these in there. Uh, a little bit of warm water makes, uh, helps it to break down, uh, take up that water a lot faster. And this will expand probably three to four times its size. Actually, this entire container was one Coco Coir brick. So you can see, you know, this made, you know, fill up almost that entire bin. And what I do is I slowly add a little bit of water at a time because you don't want your seed starting mix to be sopping wet. You've probably heard it a lot. People say you want it to be like a wrung out sponge. So if you got a sponge soaking wet and then squeezed all of the water out and then felt, <clears throat> felt the moisture that was left in it, that's what you want it to feel like. You want it to feel like you've squeezed all of the moisture out that you can and there's just a little bit, you know, left in there. So what I do is I add a little bit of water at a time because once you add too much, the only way to really remedy that is to put another block in there. And then sometimes you end up with too much uh, sitting around that you don't need yet. So I'll add a little bit of warm water at a time until it looks like it's pretty much completely um, soaked in, you know, all that it, it can soak in. And then I just use something like this potato masher. I got this tip from Lisa Mason Ziegler and I will just, um, you know, crumble it all up into pieces. Let's see what's next. Um, when it comes to filling the trays, now you don't have to use seed starting trays for the first probably five years. I used whatever I had, whether that was yogurt containers or um, little like condiment containers or um, used solo cups. I just used whatever I had and you know used recycled materials. Another thing you can do is go to places like uh, Lowe's or Home Depot or, you know, other garden centers and just ask them, hey, do you have any uh, empty containers that you plan to throw away? Excuse me. And usually they have a, a lot. <laughs> I actually have um, like a one of those plastic like six shelf like that you put in your garage full of those that I've gotten from places like that. 
But if you are going to use seed starting trays, which since I've started my cut flower farm and I grow on a much larger scale, I have invested into several different size seed starting trays. This here is a 128 cell, so the cells are very small. I am going to be starting my Lysianthus in these, um, hopefully in the next couple days, whenever I get the time. They come in 72 cells, 50 cells, and basically, 99% of the places that you buy these from, the tray is going to be the same size. The only thing that's different is the number of cells. Um, there's a couple places like Gardener Supply that theirs are like a little more than half the size of this. Um, and they're 24 cells. But most of them, they're going to be this size, but the cell is going to be larger. So like a 72 cell is like one and a half of these. A uh, 50 cell is like probably almost four of these little um, cells. And 90% of the things that I sew, I use a 72 cell. Um, that gives them enough room for the roots to grow for, you know, say four to six weeks, um, which that's something else I'll talk about is how far ahead of my last frost do I start my seeds. Most things are around four to six weeks, and most things are gonna be happy in that 72 cell tray for four to six weeks. Um, things like Lysianthus that you start 14 to 16 weeks before, uh, and they grow extremely slow and they're very small. I will start in that size tray to save space, and then whenever it comes time, if they need it, I will pot them up to a 72 cell or something larger, but usually just a 72 cell is fine for 90% of the things that you're gonna grow. Um, that's one of those things you're just gonna have to experiment with, um, you know, say buy one different, buy one like 72 cell one year, if that works for most things, just use those. If you feel like you need something bigger, then you know maybe next year invest in larger uh, cells, like 50 cells. And then here, these are dirty because these get reused, of course, but this is a shallow uh, bottom watering tray, also called a, uh, I just had it. Um, you, they're sometimes used for microgreens. So there's another word um, that they use for these, but they have these with holes and without them. These are without. I uh, put my cell tray inside of this and it's it doesn't rest on the tray. These deeper ones, These are more, um, more popular, but these trays that I got from Greenhouse Megastore, they rest on top of it and they don't go all the way down. So when the seedlings get larger and I'm trying to bottom water, um, it doesn't work because the bottom of the cell doesn't rest against the bottom of this tray, if that makes sense. For these, I can go in and lift up on it, pour the water in there, and then they can soak it up, and then I can just tip it out in my spare bathroom where my seedling grow room uh, is in. It's actually in the closet of a spare bedroom, uh, my office, and I will just go in that in the shower and just pour the extra water out. 
speaking of bottom watering, I'm not quite to that yet, but I will just go ahead and speak on that quickly. Until, well, let me, let me wait for that. So, I will do that. I will fill up my seed trays. And then once I have this totally filled up, I will go in with, like these are kind of hard because they're smaller, but like the 72 cell trays, those are perfect to take two fingers and just go like that in every single cell, very gently, not really hard. Uh, that was one thing I used to do in the beginning. I would press really hard to um, like really compact it. And then that didn't give number one, the roots really any room to grow. And number two, it didn't leave room for oxygen. When I first started growing uh, seeds indoors, I thought, I guess they were like fish. They just lived in water. So they needed soil and water and, you know, all, all was merry, but they actually need oxygen. That's why a lot of the times you'll hear people say to let them dry out between waterings. So instead of keeping them moist 100% of the time, you will water and then you will not water again until they dry out a little bit. Excuse me. And then you will water again because that gives them a couple days where they don't have that much moisture and then they are able to get oxygen. If they're sitting in water 24 seven day after day, you're gonna get things like root rot. So don't compact it too much and you know, after you tamp it down a little bit, I fill it up one more time and then you can kind of like smack it on the table to get it to settle a little bit more and then I plant my seeds. Now, when it comes to planting my seeds, um, a lot of people, they don't want all these trays on their grow light shelves that only have, you know, 50% uh, seedlings in them. So if it's a 72 cell tray, they didn't get the best germination. They only have 40 of them in there or 35 in there. Um, that's a lot of wasted space. I don't like that either. However, I'm very frugal again, like I said, and I don't want to put two or three seeds in every single cell. Um, that's just mind boggling to me. Um, unless I have super old seed, like four or five year old seed, there's no way I would do that. Even if it's very cheap seed, even if it's seed that I've saved myself. So what I will do is I will look, I don't know why I'm getting that. I will look at what it says the germination rate is. So for example, this pink champagne celosia from Florette, it says the germination, you probably can't see it, but it says the germination rate is 80%. So that means if I fill up, say this is a hundred cell tray, if I fill this up with one seed per cell, that means 20 of those cells are going to be possibly empty because of the 80% germination rate. So what I will do is about 20% of the cells, I will go and sprinkle another couple seeds. If you're not good at math, that may be very confusing, especially if it's a 72 cell or uh, you know, 128 cell. So you don't have to do that. If you want to just go ahead and sprinkle two seeds per cell, go ahead. But what I do is I do, I do the math, which it, it doesn't take long. And, you know, say it's 98% germination rate, you know, and it's 128 cell. I might not even do the math and I'll just sprinkle like eight extra seeds in there. And then the ones that were empty, well, if it was one that had two in it, hopefully one of those germinated. But if it ended up being, uh, you know, one that was empty, then one of those other cells where two came up, I will take one of those and then just fill it in. That way I have a full tray and I'm not, you know, planting double the amount of seeds. Hope that made sense. All right, so we've got our plug tray, we've got our bottom tray, and then after I have planted the seeds, I 
will go through and that's when I will put the vermiculite. Now this is not absolutely necessary. Oh, that was the other ingredient. I just remembered. I was thinking there was something else I was forgetting. Um, when I'm making my own or when I'm purchasing seed starting mix, especially if I'm about to plant something that is going to be in the tray for 8, 10, 12, 14 weeks, I will uh, take a little bit of cinnamon and mix it into the seed starting mix. Cinnamon is like an anti-fungal or antibacterial. It, it does something to help prevent mold and fungus and things like that. And if you're, um, if you're growing indoors, especially here in Southern Indiana, we have a lot of humidity and you need a lot of humidity to get those seeds to germinate. So that will keep anything from growing on top of the surface. And then this will also do that. Now this isn't 100% necessary. I just started using this, you know, the 15 years or more of, you know, seed started indoors. I've just started using this in the last probably three years. And if you get that mold or fungus um, or algae, sometimes it's like green algae growing on top, Excuse me, I don't know why I keep burping. I think it's all the coffee I drink. That's the one bad thing about doing lives is whenever you need a drink of coffee, um, you can't just <laughs> edit that part out. Um, but back to this, uh, sometimes it will be green algae, sometimes it will be like a fungus. And that will not hurt your seedlings as long as it doesn't get too terribly bad. Um, a lot of times you can just let it start to dry out, remove the humidity dome, let it start to dry out. And after a few days, it will just like die back and disappear. Um, but the vermiculite and the cinnamon mixed in will help decrease that. If it gets really, really bad, then, you know, then you can run into some issues, but I've seen some pretty severe cases of it. Um, like, uh, I forget his name, but uh, Bear Mountain Farm, he had a pretty severe case of it on his Lizzie this one year, and he had done a video about, you know, how he was fixing it, and it worked to fix it and all that, and they were fine. But this is, a very dusty <laughs> humidity dome. Um, this one has two little windows. I don't know if you can see that. There we go. Uh, little windows that you can open to vent it if it's collecting too much condensation. Uh, these I also got from Greenhouse Megastore. They're one of the most inexpensive places I've found for, uh, you know, germination trays, seed trays. But after I put the vermiculite in, you only need a very, very light dusting and then uh, put a humidity dome. And that's another thing I didn't always use. Um, I do think it definitely helps with germination rate because if your seeds dry out before germination, they will not germinate from the time you put that in the moist soil until you see that little pop of green they have to stay moist not sopping wet but just moist and this definitely helps with that uh, but there were several years that i went without using one you can also use other things like um, plastic wrap you you know Anything that you can think of to hold a little bit of moisture in that seed tray, try it. Because these can be expensive. Um, out of everything, uh, with the cell trays and all that, uh, these were the priciest. And uh, besides these plug trays, I also have the little cell trays, which I forgot to grab, but I have the little um, cell packs that you can get that you usually we'll see at your local nurseries uh, that have either four in a pack or six in a pack. Um, a lot of times you'll see like um, little broccoli starts or lettuce starts 
in like four packs or six packs. I also have those. Um, those are a lot more flimsy, so I like to use these a lot of the times. But I also like to use those, especially for some things that are like very small and very fragile. Uh, like sometimes I like to use them for my Lizzie Anthus because I can just take out a little four pack and turn it upside down and, you know, get that seedling out. But when you have a large plug tray like this and it comes time to transplanting out, um, it's usually very flimsy. This is two of them put together. It's usually very flimsy because it's, you know, got soil and water in it. Um, so sometimes it can like bend and cave in and, you know, say you're grabbing one from underneath and like squeezing on both sides and trying to pull up on the plant. Um, it can be a little cumbersome with that big plug tray. All right, we're 30 minutes in, so hopefully I'm not rambling on too much. But now the next step is going to be keeping them moist until they germinate, like I mentioned. And then after about 10 to 14 days after they have germinated, then I will, well, until they've germinated, if the humidity dome isn't keeping in enough moisture, then I will use a spray bottle to mist them. And I use this. Um, this is the brand Solo. I'm looking at the box over there. My husband got this for me. And it is the best one that I've ever used. I've gotten other brands like this Chapin or Chapin. Um, but this one is the one, like, it's been better than all of the brands that I've tried before. Um, I used to use like little, um, manual pump misters and now that I grow so many seedlings, um, yeah, I had to get something a little bit faster because I would be in there for like an hour misting with the little, you know, having to fill it up four times and that's just ridiculous. So, um, these you just fill up with water and then you just pump it few times and then you press this and you just have to stand there and hold it and mist it and it actually has a little button right here where if you push it down and then push that in excuse me you don't even have to push the button and you can just hold it and it sprays and you can also like say um say you're misting something on the floor um you know move this up and down however you need it like say something's in your way or whatever and then you can also turn it to be a very fine mist or like a jet stream this I don't know if you can tell but this has a uh, fish fertilizer in there right now so that's why it looks so dark um, what I've actually started doing is I use this for if I spray any like chemicals like uh, like a neem oil mixture or something like that. So bottom watering. Uh, I missed until I feel like, you know, a couple weeks have passed and it has a good little root, um, you know, making its way to the bottom. And then I will start bottom watering. I don't start bottom watering as soon as it germinates. Cause like I said, I don't feel like the root is down there. And if you water from the bottom and you let the soil seep, you know, seep up into the seed starting mix, a lot of the times it doesn't reach all the way to the top. Um, and unless it has a good amount of roots in there or unless it was already, you know, pretty moist to begin with. Sometimes if you are letting them dry out in between waterings, then it will be really hard to get it you know, to seep all the way back up to the top of that tray. But as long as there are some roots down there at the bottom, then it will be able to get to moisture. Um, another reason I like to bottom water is if you continue to mist from the top, like say, you know, you're letting them dry out in between waterings, but you're just, you know, doing a, a good spray, like, you know, getting them fully soaked if the if 
you're watering from the top, whenever that you know root starts to grow down, it goes down looking for water. If you're watering from the top, even if you are getting it all the way down to the bottom, if that root has you know moisture right there where it currently is, it's not going to go down looking for more moisture. If you water from the bottom, it's going to have to go down looking for moisture. So I guess that kind of, it's a good thing that when you water from the bottom, it doesn't go all the way to the top um, because then it encourages it to grow down. And then when you transplant that out, it's going to have a good root system. Um, it's going to, you know, just be able to continue growing out instead of kind of being at the top, circling around and being kind of shallow. Now, let's see. Uh, now, with, uh, with watering, after they're a couple weeks old, I don't do it the first couple weeks because they're very small, they're fragile little roots. Um, I can't really say when I start. Um, I, well, yes, I can. I usually wait until it has about two sets of true leaves. Um, some things take much longer than others for that to happen. So I can't really say, you know, two weeks or three weeks. I wait until it looks like it has, you know, a good enough root system. And usually if it has, you know, two sets of true leaves, some people say the first set of true leaves, uh, you can start with a 50% strength. Sometimes I do that, but you can end up burning your seedlings, um, you know, being too strong of a mixture. And usually they have enough energy um, for the first, you know, few weeks that, you know, they're not going to suffer in a sterile seed mixture, you know, for a few weeks. So I just, I kind of, you know, I, I go off looking at them. Um, so that's one thing if you're a beginner, it's kind of one of those things you just kind of have to learn after doing it for a couple years. But one of the products that I use is this Alaska Fish Fertilizer. Um, it's 511 it's higher in nitrogen so it helps that green leafy growth um, another product that i use is neptune's harvest and it is a little more expensive but it smells a lot less strong than this one does this one you you want to close <laughs> you want to close the door after you've fertilized and you definitely don't want to spill it like i did last year uh, <laughs> Was it me or was it my son? I don't remember, but I had a huge mess in my office bathroom and it smelled for a couple months. And the Neptune's Harvest, it is a lot less potent. So I, I think it's worth the money, but I got that on sale, so I picked a, a couple of those up. Let's see. Okay, I was just checking if there were any questions. Um, so how often do I fertilize? Um, honestly, it depends on how much time I have. Um, I try to do it at least every two weeks and, you know, even when I wait till it has a couple sets of true leaves, I will start off with, you know, like a, a less, a less strong, it's getting late, <laughs> a less uh, concentrated fertilizer mixture so I won't use you know the full strength uh, that they recommend the first time or two times um, and then you know the third and so on then I would do full strength and I try to do that every two weeks when it comes to uh, fertilizer like in the mix some people will say that they mix in a slow release fertilizer i've tried that several times and every time that i try that it ends up getting like a chemical smell and kills my seedlings um, it ends up i have like damping off issues and i have a lot of fungus growth um, last year i tried it one more time with my tomatoes and it 
I guess burnt a lot of them even though it was supposed to be an organic slow release fertilizer I didn't add that much but it it had to have been that is is what I think but I guess it could have been something else but yeah I'm not gonna try that anymore I would rather just use the liquid So one thing that I just skipped right over is grow lights. So after you uh, put that, you know, after you've seeded them and, you know, you're keeping them moist, what are you doing with them? Well, they need to be under grow lights. Um, I have a grow light room in my office, in the closet. I think I already said that. Um, and I have several shelves that I have a couple different grow light systems um, that I use, excuse me, um, I looked up on Amazon to see exactly, uh, what kind they were, excuse me, and they are 6,000 on the Kelvin rating. Um, if you are new to Girl Whites, that is the one thing, if you ignore, like, all of the other, uh, all of the other I cannot I cannot think like if you ignore the watts if you ignore the um, I'm so, I'm sorry I'm having a total brain fart right now if you ignore everything else though is what I'm trying to get at don't ignore the Kelvin um, you want to get something between 4,000 and 6,500 Kelvin. Uh, that on the light spectrum is the closest to like daylight. And that is what you're going to need for the best seedling growth for photosynthesis and all that. Now, the ones that I have are the... LED strip lights, the ones that I have the most of are the LED, LED strip lights, and they are four foot, and they're 40 watts, and they're 6,000 Kelvin, and they're 5,200 lumen. I see that now. That was the other stat that I was looking for. Now, the watts and all that, that's going to be different based on how, how long the grow light is. So, if it's a two-foot grow light, um, they're going to be between 15 and 20 watts. If it's a four foot, it's going to be between like 20 and 30 watts, or I'm sorry, 35 and 40 watts. If it's eight foot, you know, you get the point. So the, the watts, if, if you're getting say a two foot light and you're like, oh, well, it's only 20 watts, but this four foot light is 40 watts. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's stronger. It just means, I don't know how to explain it, like, um, it's, it's not necessarily stronger, it's just there's, it's spread out, you know, four feet. So even though there's more, it's spread out, so it's not necessarily stronger. Now, I have gotten the cheapest of the cheap grow lights, and I've gotten the well, not the most high end because there's lights out there that are like $6,000. Um, but I've gotten, you know, on the pricier end of the grow lights and then the cheapest of the cheap and several in between. And you can really get by with any of them. You can get by with the cheapest of the cheap for several years when I first started and I didn't really have the money to invest in any, you know, any better grow lights. I used um, shop lights that I got for free from my work and I just replaced the bulbs. They were um, fluorescent bulbs and they were uh, the 18 inch ones. They were really small. I had them on one of those shelves that you put in your garage and they literally only had enough like strength to cover like six solo cups um but i would do full plug trays under it and what i would do since it wasn't strong enough for that is i would take them outside every day to supplement the light and i was able to grow healthy seedlings that way but it was a lot of work 
So since, you know, since I've gotten started my cut flower farm and I've gotten a larger vegetable garden, now I have invested in, you know, larger, better light systems. But you can get away with cheaper ones, ones that aren't as strong. Um, yeah. So the ones that I recommend, the ones that I have the most of are the, you know, I recommend the four foot ones. You can get them in two foot, eight foot. Um, you know, it really just depends on your needs. Um, even if you need or want a really long um, shelf, I recommend the four foot because you can just clip them together. Say you change your mind and you want to do two four foot shelves. It's, you know, it's a little bit more flexible in that way. Um, but again, I will leave a link to all the things that I mentioned and I will leave a link to that if you're interested in checking those out. Um, what I do for my grow light shelves using those four foot lights is I put two to three per shelf and then I put the uh, shelf under it where the seed tray goes about 12 inches away. Um, when the seedlings are really young, so they're much further away, sometimes I will prop it up to be a little closer to the light. Or if there's only two uh, four foot uh, shop lights, then I will uh, prop it up. That way it's getting a little bit more light. Um, and then, you know, once they grow taller, I can remove whatever I had underneath and, you know, they have more room to grow. That way I don't have to have you know, some kind of thing to like constantly move the lights up and down and things like that. Um, I've also, uh, I've also got lights like the Morris Hydros um, that are a little bit more expensive. Um, I have a couple of the TS 600s and they're, you know, they're not like in the thousands, like some of them can be. I think those were like $120 each and those are really good. However, I have learned that they're not necessary. Um, those are more for growing things. Um, I forget his name, but he calls them Mary tomatoes. Um, or if you're trying to grow things to flower, basically. If you're just growing seedlings, they're just not necessary. Um, they have the light spectrum that you would need to grow something all the way to flower stage and fruiting stage. So, you know, if you want to grow a tomato in your house during the winter and try to get it to fruit, then, you know, then you could get something like that. But just for growing seedlings in the seedling stage, um, those type of lights are not necessary. All right, so then we covered keeping them moist until they germinate, bottom watering, fertilizing. Now, some other, other things I wanted to talk about is uh, when do I sow? Like, when do I decide how far before my last frost do I um, start the seeds? I'm trying to think if I should maybe make a part two because we're 45 minutes in. So let me just quickly cover... Um, how do I decide that and um, these products that I have right here and then I will do a part two if you all would like more information on what I do. So what I do to begin with is I write down everything that I plan to grow. Now before when I was just growing vegetables and like companion flowers like um, zinnias and marigolds in between in my vegetable beds um, and a few things for my flower beds. I just did that, you know, all in one list. But since I have my cut flower farm, I do this separately. So I do my cut flower farm all in, you know, one plan. And then I do my vegetables and like bedding flowers all in another. And what I would do is I will either write them down or usually type them up, excuse me, all, um, I type them all up, like just general, like the crop, like I don't put, 
you know, say it's bachelor buttons. Like I don't put like all of the varieties. I just put bachelor buttons, Bells of Ireland, Slosha, things like that. And I type it up and then I will go through. Now Johnny's is a good resource for figuring out how many weeks before your last frost to seed them. Um, there's a couple more out there. Uh, usually it's going to be on your seed pack, but sometimes you will get differing information. Um, so sometimes, for example, I pulled these out. I have seeds here from MI Gardener, Johnny's, and Florette. For carnations, Florette says to start them 10 to 12 weeks before your last frost. Johnny's says six to eight weeks before your last frost. And then, oh, and my gardener also says 10 to 12 weeks. I thought it said eight to 12, sorry. But we have three different companies, two different answers. That is one thing, like you may just have to just pick something and then see how it works out. If it ended up getting very leggy, um, if it, you know, grew way too fast and was getting very unhappy before it was time for you to transplant out, then, you know, you will just have to change that year to year. Um, sometimes even the best research, like you just have to do it yourself. You just have to try it and see what works for you because even if, you know, everyone had the same number, your conditions may be a little bit, a little bit different and you may need to change that number of weeks. But what I do is I write down all of the crops that I'm going to grow and then I go through every seed packet or if it's not on the seed packet, I look it up on Johnny's or something like that. And then I write down on this how many weeks before to start the seed. So for asters, I have six to eight weeks. For carnations, I put 10 to 12. Celosia, I put two to four. I think it recommends um, something different. It's either four to six or six to eight, but I can see where I erased it and I put two to four because for me, that one was a really fast grower and they were beginning to get very unhappy in their plug tray. And so I didn't want to start them that early and then just become unhappy. Um, Dusty Miller, 10 weeks. Uh, Love and a Mist. I erased what they said and I have four to six weeks. Um, you get the idea. So then once I got all those numbers, and yes, <laughs> when you have all these seeds, that's very time consuming. But it's so worth it. Because then I take post-it notes and I will put a post-it note for 10 to 12 weeks, 8 to 10, 6 to 8, 4 to 6, 2 to 4, you know, and so on. And I will put what crop get or flower or whatever gets seed started in that amount of time. And then I have this whole page that when it comes, you know, 10 to 12 weeks before my last frost, I, I just have one little post-it note. And that's all that I have to look at. I think that I got that tip from uh, Laura from Garden Answer. So instead of having to worry about all that and having to every year look at all of those seed packets, you know, look through pa you know paperwork and notes, I just have this one little post-it note based on the date that I have to look at. And I know that I have a two to three week time period to get all of that flower or vegetable or whatever planted, seed started. And again, if something gets very unhappy, grows a lot faster, then the next year I'll just change it. Let's see. I think that is about it for that. 
So very quickly, I want to touch on what do I do if I have a fungus net issue or something like that in my grow room. Now, in previous years, every time I seen a bug, I would be like, I've got to do something about it. And I would go get, you know, go on Google, try to figure out what that bug was. And then I would go get a product that said it killed it. And I didn't pay attention to whether that killed beneficials or any of that stuff because I just didn't know. I didn't even think about that. And especially, especially now with how the beneficials are, you know, just really becoming endangered. Monarch butterflies were added to the endangered species list this year. And sometimes I feel like some people, you know, like not, not exaggerate, but like, maybe exaggerate a little bit that I don't think people are exaggerating about. In previous years, I, at any given time, I would go out to my garden and I would see no less than 10, 15, sometimes 20 monarchs on my in my cut flower farm. Last year, I saw two on my cut, in my cut flower farm area and I saw one in my front flower bed all year. Now I did find a lot of monarch caterpillars and luckily a lot of those, um, you know, formed cocoons and I seen like they're empty cocoons, but three, like that's, that's crazy to me because like I said, I usually see at the minimum 10 every time I go outside. And the same for swallowtail butterflies. Those are very like prominent around here in Southern Indiana and I only saw a handful of those all year. So I do not spray now anything. For one, it has to be organic. And for two, I don't spray unless there's something like really out of control. Now fungus nets, that's the one thing that even if I see one of them, I will try to do something about. Because if you have one and it lays eggs in your seed starting mix in one of your trays, then you're going to have a lot of them. And the last couple years, I've really had an issue with fungus nets. But if I see an aphid, especially an, an aphid, you have to have a lot of aphids for it to damage your plants enough. Now, if your seedling's only this big and there's 20 aphids on it, then yes, it can kill your little seedling. But you have to have a lot of aphids to really do some damage. Even in the garden, I've had plants covered in them. And, you know been busy and not taking care of it and you know go there two weeks later and they're all still there and there's you know a couple leaves that look like all of the um hydration or um moisture has been taken out of the leaf and that's about it um i will usually out in the garden just spray them off with a water hose people say they'll crawl back up I've never noticed that. Usually I spray them off with a water hose and that plant I've never seen like covered again um, or even any of them next to it. Um, I don't know. I know everyone has different opinions on that, but I try to spray as little as possible. If, I, if you are going to use something, um, neem oil is a good product but you want to make sure you have organic cold pressed neem oil. For many years I was using this and this is neem oil extract concentrate and this does not have, it's an, it's an extract of neem oil. It's not, you know, the whole product. And if it's not cold pressed, then it doesn't have it doesn't have everything that you need to for it to uh, kill that bug. So I would use this and I would be like, why am I still having all these bug issues? That was why. So I found this last year on Amazon and I think I've used it maybe two times. I think I've only used it once. Um, but I only really use this with, like if my seedlings are really small, like say I'm hardening them off. Usually inside I've never had a bad issue with aphids, 
Um, I usually just have a couple where I can just like, like squish them. Um, if I'm hardening them off, they're still very small and they're outside and they're starting to get infested. And it looks like usually only tomatoes are like something that I would have to spray. Most other things, they don't seem to really get any damage. Um, so then I will use this product. But since I've been more uh, mindful of what I use, um, I don't, I don't really have to use it and I don't ever have anything like too bad. I've never had a plant die is what I'm trying to get at or even really get very damaged. Um, but this, they recommend to add a little bit of mild soap. So that's why I have this. And then this I found on clearance. Um, this is Captain Jack's dead bug. And this is good for if you happen to have a spider mite issue um, a couple years ago, I got a lot of roses on clearance, and I got a really bad spider mite um, outbreak in my um, grow room, and Laura from Garden Answer um, is the one that I believe recommended this, and she is right when she says that those are very, very difficult to get rid of. Um, I don't know how, but I got a very bad outbreak of it under control, though, um, with this. This is also organic, but even with organics, that doesn't mean that it doesn't harm beneficials. It just means that it's a lot safer. Um, so, you know, like especially anything that kills like caterpillars and things like that, um, it's going to kill, you know, butterflies in the caterpillar stage and things like that. So you still wanna be mindful of using it if you don't absolutely need to, and you wanna be mindful of what time you use it um, you know, like for, uh, for when you're using it outside, you want to try to use it when at dawn, or I'm sorry, at dusk, whenever all of the bees have gone to bed and things like that. Like, just do your research because, you know, like I said, I don't use it very much. I always do research whenever I am about to use something to make sure I'm spraying it at the right time because I'm not an expert, um, when it comes to that. I just wanted to let you know two of the products that I use if I do have an issue. It's usually with aphids. Um, well, not usually with spider mites. I just had that one issue that one year. It's usually fungus gnats. <laughs> and what I do for fungus gnats, I don't have any of them um, with me. But what I do for those, for catching the adults, that is very important. You want to try to catch all of the adults because those are what is going to perpetuate the problem. Those are going to be what lays the eggs and they can lay hundreds of eggs either a week or a day. So um, from um, Gardener Supply or Amazon or I'm sure other places you can get these little uh, yellow sticky traps and don't use those outside guys. Those are going to catch very important pollinators and beneficial insects. You only want to use those inside for catching uh, things like fungus nets and then there's a product called natural that you can also get from Gardner's workshop and I, I actually use that every other week um, the week that I don't fertilize I use that you don't want to mix that natural with fertilizer excuse me um, it can make it where it doesn't like have an effect and I use it no way, I don't use it every other week. No, that you have to use every five to seven days. I don't know what I was thinking. I gotta use it when I'm not fertilizing though. That's what I was thinking of. So you have to use it often enough to where you get the eggs before they hatch. Again, I'm frugal and I was, maybe that's what it was. At one time I wasn't using it as often as I should have been and I was still having an issue, and Lisa Mason Ziegler from Garner's Workshop explained, you have to use it often enough to where it kills, you know, kills them before they hatch. 
if you use it and then an egg hatches and then six days later or an egg is laid and then six days later it hatches and you don't use it you know for another four days well they've all already hatched so make sure you use it enough I know a lot of people also I've seen say like that didn't work for me and maybe that's why but all right guys hopefully this video was helpful for you if you stayed the entire time I greatly greatly appreciate it if you want to check out any of these products I would greatly appreciate if you use my link and if you're watching the replay if you found any of this helpful I would greatly or if you're watching it live I would greatly appreciate the thumbs up subscribe if you haven't already and I will talk to you in the next one